Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for attending today's webinar series. Um, today's topic is going to be Recycle. Today you'll get a preview of the high quality of technical presentations given at the International Water Conference. Be sure to mark your calendar for this year's International Water Conference that will be in Orlando, Florida on November 12th to the 16th. The IWC Executive Committee has got some great things in the work for, works for this year's conference. We'll be utilizing the IWC app again this year. If you're not familiar, we have an app that you can download on your Android, Apple, or the web. We're going to add the download instructions to our registration confirmation and have a link on the website that will be coming soon. We have also added a university outreach aspect to the conference, offering scholarship opportunities, a student poster session, and more. To find out more information, you can visit the website, um, and it's circled in red on the presentation. If you have not signed up to be an exhibitor at the conference this year, there is still time to reserve a spot. Although space is limited, um, there is spots available, and for more information, you can visit the website as well, circled in red. For today's webinar, you'll be given an opportunity to ask Q&A to the, each speaker. To ask a question, please type it in the question or the chat field in the Q&A field, um, and I'll ask the question for you. If you think of a question in the middle of the presentation, feel free to type it during the presentation, because it will not disrupt the speaker. For those attending that need one available PDH hour for certificates, they'll be um, emailed to you within a week of the webinar, and if you're viewing this webinar in a group setting, please fill out the webinar group login sheet found on the IWC webinar best, best of webinar page on the IWC website, and then email me the form um, when it's completed. Now let's get to the presentation. I'd like to welcome Jason Stevens to the webinar. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you can see, uh, we're going to be discussing today the reuse of municipal wastewater and industrial plant supply. Um, and uh, Taylor, in terms of getting this to display my screen here. Yep, I gave you the presenter role, and now you just need to select share your screen on the quick start menu. Okay. All right, can you see my screen at this point? Okay, and yes. it's like uh, what we're looking for here. Um, all right, so um, before we get started here, I'd just like to welcome everyone and uh, um, give a quick shout out to Tracy Boswell, um, who is our field service engineer. Um, she was critical in making this uh, come together, along with other members of our engineering, installation, operations, and sales team, uh, in order to make this pilot successful. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the design and the operation of a 12-month-long UFRO pilot that was run at a municipal waste treatment plant in the Texas Gulf Coast. Um, so maybe the first question here is, why pilot? Um, our customer was adding a large unit to their chemical plant, and they needed significant amounts of additional boiler feed water and cooling tower makeup. Their initial plan is to tap their current freshwater source, uh, which was a river adjacent to the plant, ran into some trouble. <clears throat> Low flow conditions in the river uh, caused by a drought combined with a uh, neighboring plant's senior water rights, uh, just in time to demonstrate to plant management that the river might not be sufficient for their current needs, uh, much less the future needs. Uh, test wells were drilled and the water came up brackish. <clears throat> Given the proximity to the uh, Gulf of Mexico here, this was not unexpected. Uh, still a full sale well was drilled and several months of pumping water from that well at 500 gallons a minute showed a continuing increase in the salinity of the well water. Throughout their investigation, the customer was most focused on finding a solution that would work as well 20 years from now as next year. Um, this would be something that would allow them to make their products and grow their business without negatively impacting their community or their industrial neighbors. Uh, municipal wastewater reuse, though not commonly practiced in this part of the country, uh, appeared to fit the bill. Uh, so the plant approached us uh, 
looking to uh, understand several key things. Um, one, what was the variability of this uh, municipal wastewater um, as it went as we progressed through seasonal changes and uh, ebbs and flows at, at the waste treatment plant? They also wanted to uh, confirm a design, including membrane selections, membrane fluxes, recoveries throughout the system, and so forth, and have a good understanding of the operating expenses, including chemical consumption, labor, and power. Um, also, they wanted to, to confirm the effluent quality and, and develop confidence in the solution. So I apologize, this is a bit of an eye chart, but uh, it's a good overview uh, process flow diagram for the system. Um, so I'll try to quickly familiarize everyone with the various unit operations we have here uh, as a context for the rest of our discussion. The heart of the pilot is a mobile trailer that contains a raw water tank, a four-module UF skid, filtrate tank, filtrate pump, and a six-membrane RO skid, and some ancillary equipment uh, such as a sump, instrument air system, and so forth. The water was initially supplied to the trailer by a sump pump suspended in the uh, wastewater treatment plant's effluent basin, uh, but after a few quick failures of that pump and uh, replacements, we changed to a self-priming centrifugal pump and had no further issues. All the clear waste from the pilot, these are things like the excess UF filtrate, um, the RO permeate, the RO concentrate, uh, were combined and put back into the effluent basin at the wastewater treatment plant, uh, downstream from the suction of the feed pump. But any turbid waste, so things like UF backwashes, chemically enhanced backwashes, needed to be neutralized and then pumped to the headworks of the municipal wastewater treatment plant. So translating that from lines on paper to uh, equipment in the field, you can see some pictures of the, uh, the system, the, the trailer that has the UF and RO system there, as well as the waste neutralization tank, uh, some chemical pumps, and uh, some platforms that we had for accessing the trailer safely. I want to give a big thanks to Eric Jensen, Rob Temple, David Brennan, and others who worked to uh, install this, commission it, and make it successful. So there were certain things that we had direct control over in this testing and that we manipulated during the course of the pilot. Um, you can see those include things like uh, UF gross flux, um, filtration time between backwashes, the interval on chemically enhanced backwashes, uh, coagulant dose, RO parameters such as flux recovery and recycle flow. Um, there are other things, uh, by manipulating those variables, we end up setting other parameters up. For example, once UF gross flux and filtration time and chemically enhanced backwash interval are sent, the UF recovery can be calculated. Uh, if you add in the coagulant dose information, you can also calculate the chemical consumption. What you can't calculate are things like the system performance, rate of fouling, product quality, the labor requirements. Demonstrating those over the course of a full year was one of our primary objectives here. So we knew going into the testing that this water was going to present a greater degree of variability than most of the other waters that we've treated, but it was still a bit of an eye-opening experience to me to see concentrations of uh, certain key components varying by an order of magnitude or more in some cases, uh, especially looking at turbidity, nitrate, phosphate, and uh, chlorine. Uh, these components uh, on the right were measured approximately monthly by sampling and lab analysis. So, so the chlorine, phosphate, ammonia, nitrate, and POC were not continuously monitored, but were grabbed uh, on a monthly basis or as necessary for troubleshooting. Uh, those uh, parameters on the right, such as uh, temperature, conductivity, and turbidity, were recorded continuously throughout the pilot uh, using electronic systems. Um, one thing here to note also is that uh, varying amounts of chlorine uh, combined with, <coughs> pardon me, combined with varying amounts of residual ammonia in the wastewater plant to effluent to form a range of chloramines and occasionally some free chlorine. Uh, it's kept the UF membranes rather well sanitized, uh, but did create some problems for operating the RO. Um, also, uh, phosphate can be particularly problematic because there's both a nutrient for biological growth and a scale forming component in the RO. And we'll start to see some of the problems develop here as we move through this. Looking closely at turbidity for just a minute, we see that turbidity was highly variable throughout the pilot. The average turbidity ran about seven NTU, but there were uh, significant spikes in each month, as well as extended periods of time, such as uh, July, 
when the turbidity ran in excess of 40 MTU almost every day. Um, even though the UF membranes selected for the testing in this pilot were not intended to handle extreme turbidity events, uh, we found they handled the brief excursions above 250 MTU quite well. Well, we did have one high uh, TMP event that was directly linked to one of these excursions. Uh, it came at a time when we were exercising the flux and may have been related also to a mechanical failure that we found uh, a short time later. Um, we saw the greatest difficulties actually in maintaining a low TMP uh, in the U.S. during late January uh, when the feed water was consistently low in turbidity. Looking at, at this range of time, we actually see a pretty low continuous turbidity and we had uh, difficult uh, operations on the U.S. this time. I'll touch on that a little bit more in detail later on, but I uh, thought it was worth noting at this point. So here we see the initial performance of the U.S. as we move from a conservative uh, 25 GSD gross flux up to a 45 GSD uh, gross flux. So the dots in yellow show the U.S. gross flux. Uh, so that's the instantaneous flow of water divided by the surface area of the membrane. Uh, and <coughs> the blue uh, dots show, <coughs> pardon me, uh, show the normalized permeability, and the green dots show the raw TMP data. And for clarity, these are daily averages rather than instantaneous readings. As expected, the TMP increases in line with the flux, uh, rising from about 0.9 psi when we were operating at 25 GFD to about 2.5 psi at 45 GFD. The normalized permeability held pretty steady between 15 and 20 GFD per PSI after the initial break-in period. So obviously with the brand new UF membranes, our permeability was, was quite good in the 23 range. Um, but once things settled into a normal operation, 15 to 20 was our typical. You can see we're pretty cautious at first. Um, we operated, we hung out at 25 and 30 GFD for a couple months apiece um, before moving relatively more quickly. Uh, through 35 and 40 GFD. We got to 45 GFD and things ran quite well for a while. We were even toying with the idea of going to uh, 50 GFD after Thanksgiving. Unfortunately, we all know that if something's going to go wrong, it'll be so at the most inopportune time. So headed into Thanksgiving, um, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, the inevitable finally happened. Around mid-morning on Tuesday, feed turbidity, which is here in orange, um, spiked above 250 NTU. Um, 250 NTU was the limit for the, um, the instrument that we had for measuring the turbidity. Uh, the turbidity event resulted in a more rapid rise in TMP, which is our blue dots here, than we had previously seen. Certainly contributing to that were the lower water temperature, uh, as we were headed into November, or uh, well into November actually, and the higher flux, uh, running at 45 GFD. Uh, we can see that TMP went from a baseline of about two to three and a half PSI, up to nine PSI. And at that point, the, uh, the PLC on the system shut down the UF in order to prevent any potential damage to the membranes and allow the operator to respond to the situation. Investigation by the operator found that the chemical feeds and all the other parts of the system appeared to be in working order. The noise water uh, treatment plant effluent was back to its typical low value. So the operator restarted the pilot and the baseline uh, the baseline TMP of 2 PSI was quickly restored. So continuing the theme, if something's going to go wrong, it will go wrong at the most inopportune time. We can see that heading into and continuing over the New Year's holiday, we had a trend of decreasing permeability. Permeability started in the range of 12 to 7 GFT per PSI as you move through the individual filtration cycles and then back washes. <clears throat> But then it dropped uh, by nearly 3 GFI, GFD per PSI over the course of about four days. So it didn't take much digging to find out that this was due to poor chemical enhanced backwashes. A slow shift in the alkalinity of the feed water combined with some problems in the acid metering pump meant that the acid step of our chemically enhanced backwash wasn't hitting the target pH range of less than 2. In fact, for a few days, the acid step was running closer to 3.5. Once we got the chemical dosages reset and the pump adjusted, the permeability returned to its previous range within four days. So this is uh, both good and bad, obviously. You know, bad that uh, we didn't have control over the CEV step at this point in the pilot, um, but good that uh, we were able to recover 
uh, relatively quickly with no additional needs for double CEBs or extended backwashes or a, a complex clean in place step. Uh, so those were a couple of what turned out to be a handful of minor problems with the pilot over the course of the winter. Here we can see the UF membrane uh, transmembrane pressure in blue. And the y-axis is uh, slightly offset upwards to allow us to also see the feed turbidity in orange. There's a lot of correlation between these two, as you might imagine. Um, so we talked about uh, here in November the uh, feed turbidity excursion that we had just before Thanksgiving. Um, here again also at the beginning of December there was a feed turbidity excursion and a uh, commensurate uh, TMP excursion, then no recovery. Um, also, uh, during this time period, uh, we found that we had some feed water bypassing the U.S. and going into the filtrate tank, and that started to record at, to, uh, to cause uh, poor quality backwashes. So you can see here during this uh, little part of December that uh, we had TMPs go up, and uh, even our baseline TMP took a, a step change upward here because we had some of this feed water going into our filtrate tank and we're using it for backwashing. That was the result of a, a failed solenoid valve on a, uh, a vent line on the U.S. Uh, we identified the problem and corrected it, um, but we can see that it resulted overall in uh, some fouling of the system and uh, increased TMPs moving forward. Over here at D, we can see our uh, New Year's Day uh, loss of uh, the CEBs, uh, loss of the acid system there, and coming back online. Um, from January 23rd to about February 4th, um, we saw high fouling in feed water. This is that period of time where I mentioned where our turbidities were actually quite low, um, but the TMPs were high, and no amount of uh, CEBs would allow us to recover that uh, and get back to normal operating range for our TMPs. Um, we suspect that uh, the polymer overfeed from the wastewater treatment plant at this point, um, and uh, as a result, we entered into a set of aggressive cleanings and reduced the flux to the UF here, and that way we were able to, to recover TMPs and, and restore good operations of the UF. Uh, fuel flux was reduced from 45 GFD to 35 GFD um, there towards the beginning of February. Um, and then uh, here on F, we can see a quick TMP spike that doesn't correlate with any turbidity coming from the plant. Um, what had happened here was we lost a coagulant pump uh, feeding the, uh, on the water feeding the U.S. And so uh, we weren't getting that microflocculation that we like to see that results in, in good long filtration cycles and uh, quick recovery with backwash. Um, as soon as we were able to replace the coagulant pump, everything came right back into line and uh, showed us that the UF membranes were pretty robust and could withstand uh, some upset conditions there. Um, so the takeaway here is that despite a variety of issues, feed turbidity spikes, valve failures, improper chemical dosing, and so forth, um, the pilot system never had an extended offline period, and UF continued to make very good water at an aggressive uh, and later than at a, at a moderate flux of 35 GSE. Um, really quickly, I want to talk about phosphate and TOC removal um, as compared to coagulant dose. Uh, we would typically expect to see um, precipitation of phosphate and coagulation of TOC with uh, dosing of metal coagulants. Uh, we use iron in this uh, instance, but uh, aluminum should have some more effect here. Um, so the top line in the light blue dot is phosphate removal, um, and the line is just the, the linear interpolation of the data points. Uh, the middle line and the green dots are the TOC removal, and the bottom line and red dots are the U.S. filtrate turbidity. Um, as expected, adding ferric did increase the removal of phosphate across the U.S. Um, due to the precipitation of the, the ferric phosphate. Um, somewhat unexpected was how flat the trend was for TOC removal uh, with increasing ferric dosage. Uh, we saw anywhere from 0 to 50 percent removal of TOC, and uh, we typically saw about 3 to 8 ppm of TOC in the U.S. filtrate. Um, so apparently significant portions of the organics in the wastewater are not susceptible to traditional
additional coagulation and uh, removal of the filtration. It does place a significant burden on the downstream RO. And one of our recommendations is to investigate enhanced coagulation for removal of TOC. The turbidity numbers were as expected. Uh, filtrate turbidity was excellent after the UF, regardless of the feed turbidity or the coagulant dose. Um, looking really quickly here, you can see the coagulant pump failure and how this uh, normalized permeability trended both ahead of that coagulant pump failure, during the coagulant pump failure, and then immediately after restoration of coagulant dosage. Um, pretty interesting to me to see how quickly we can come back up to our uh, baseline normalized permeability, you know, within a couple of, uh, of cycles here. Um, and immediately upon bringing the system online, you can see there's a, a big jump in the normalized permeability along with the continued recovery over the next uh, day or so. Um, we've talked a lot about performance of the UF, and really that's where most of the uncertainty was going into the pilot. Um, as we know, proper pretreatment ahead of, U of RO is critical to the performance of, and the cost to run an RO system. And unfortunately, we ended up proving that here. Um, we also demonstrated something else that we already knew all too well. TFC RO membranes don't like chlorine. Uh, what you see, see here is the performance data for the second set of RO membranes that we brought uh, into this pilot. The first set uh, were torched when the ORP probe failed at the end of June. Uh, that resulted in a uh, loss of bisulfite feed ahead of the RO and some free chlorine hitting the RO membranes and uh, obviously damaging them. We pulled that uh, set out at the end of uh, June, beginning of July, and we ran on these membranes from our fleet until we could install some new ones at the beginning of August. Uh, so this chart runs from August through the end of the pilot. You can see a couple of gaps in here where we had membrane cleanings uh, performed off-site. During those periods, we used uh, membranes from our float set. Um, because they uh, don't have baseline data, we didn't want to show the, the oral performance here for the, the float set. This is just for the dedicated uh, pilot set. Um, you can see feed conductivity was highly variable, the blue dots here. Um, it, uh, Typically ran pretty high, but during rain events, we would get dilution, and uh, you can see the, uh, the conductivity drops off. Um, rejection uh, in orange is pretty consistent uh, throughout the service cycle and across cleanings as well. Uh, the rejection range from 96 to 99 percent. Um, you do see that we have a very short run um, here in the middle from mid-November through mid December. This corresponded with the, um, the solenoid valve failure that allowed a portion of the wastewater to bypass the UF into the filtrate tank. Uh, and obviously feeding um, even blended wastewater um, from the plant without any filtration was not a good experience for the RO. So looking at the fouling trends, you can see um, net driving pressure in orange here um, on the right axis and then differential pressure and um, normalized permeate flow on the left axis, so differential pressure being in blue and the normalized permeate flow being in gray. A um, couple of interesting things here. There's a sudden reduction in DP and uh, driving pressure at the end of September. Um, we believe that that was some chloramine um, killing the bio that had been growing in the oral membrane. Um, you can also see the rapid rates of fouling at several points here, uh, mid-August, uh, early October, and then in November and December. Um, again, we know the second run um, was short due to the, the problems with the uh, feed water bypassing UF. We're unsure of the, the causes of these other um, very rapid rises in the net driving pressure on the RO. Um, we did grab the membranes and do some, uh, some autopsies, and I'll discuss those a little bit later. Um, Typically what we saw was uh, high levels of organics, um, we believe both TOC and biological. We do see that uh, we get good ND <coughs> good driving pressure and uh, normalized permeate flow recoveries with the cleanings. And we we're able to come back down very close to uh, where our baselines were uh, for DPs and uh, get good normalized permeate flows with the cleanings and without sacrificing rejection. The autopsy results, uh, we had three membranes autopsy, the, the tail element of the RO on October 11th, and then both the lead and the tail at the end of the pilot. 
um, in all of those, it was pretty consistent. Fowlet was uh, predominantly organic. There were bacteria present. Um, the inorganics were a minor component of the fouling and primarily consisted of calcium, phosphorus, silica, aluminum, and magnesium. So some silt and also probably some calcium phosphate uh, scaling in here. And there were positive Fujiwara tests, um, given that the, the feed water from the, uh, the wastewater treatment plant was chlorinated, that was not unexpected. So in conclusion, we saw highly variable feed. Um, we did see the UF was very robust. Um, we did have problems with organics and phosphates that made it through the UF and impacted the RO, resulting in high uh, frequent RO cleanings. The quality of the RO product was very high, um, greater than what was required by the plant, um, but in line with uh, our expectations. Overall, we had a successful pilot, and we had several recommendations coming out of that pilot. Um, the UF, we wanted to operate at moderate flux and recovery uh, for the full scale system. The RO should also be operated at a very a conservative flux and recovery uh, with high cross flow to minimize the amount of fouling. Coagulation was critical. We saw that when we lost coagulation, uh, TMP went up very quickly. We recommended at least two ppm of iron and considering enhanced coagulation, dosing very high levels of iron and some acid in order to get improved. TOC removal. Redundancy would be a standard N plus one online sparing for all the process pumps. Um, we felt that a permeate flush would have been a <clears throat> an excellent addition to the pilot here. Um, and for full scale systems should be something that would be automated with the ability to add acid and caustic um, for a, a quick removal of TOC or scale that might begin to form um, in the RO. Uh, clean in place is very important for both UF and RO uh, operations here. So having a, a clean in place system available at the site uh, was a recommendation. And then uh, because we did see some times in the RO membranes where um, DPs and net driving pressures uh, went from high values to low values without any effort on our part, um, and uh, analysis seemed to indicate chloramines were helping, um, we considered uh, recommending uh, some type of system for dosing chloramines and ensuring that we had uh, very low level chloramines hitting the RO membranes in order to, to keep biological growth from minimum. And uh, that's the end. I'd just like to thank everybody for their attention. And uh, if there are any follow-up questions, you can contact uh, me now or at the email address you see there. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now open it up to any questions if anyone has any right now on the spot. You can type them in the um, chat field or the Q&A field um, if you would like to ask. I know we had one question that came in. Um, at what GFD, uh, hold on one second. At what GFD was the RO able to operate? Let me get to the data for that. I believe, working from memory here, that the, um, we started off the RO at a uh, flux of 14 GFD and uh, ended up keeping it, backing it down closer to 12. Um, let me actually find that. Um, yes, the RO, um, our recommendation was to operate at 12 GFD or less. Um, during the pilot, we operated at 14 GFD and then back down to um, 13 GFD. Again, if there's any other questions, um, feel free to email um, the speaker or myself, and we'll try to answer those questions for you. Um, but thank you again. And um, with that, we're going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, I'd like to introduce to the webinar Rich Frank. Rich, can you hear us? I can hear you. Great. Hmm. And 
You are all set to share your screen with everyone. Got it. Can you see my screen? Yep. Looks great. All right. Again, my name is Rich Franks. I'm the manager of applications at Nido Hydronautics, a membrane manufacturer. We'll be talking about industrial wastewater recycling and energy conservation using high temperature RO membranes. Hopefully the title captures what uh, we all know when it comes to water, that uh, energy conservation or energy and water are very closely tied. And so I hope what I can do in this presentation is uh, demonstrate how uh, a new product, a new high temperature RO membrane helps not only with water recycling, but also energy conservation. Uh, since I am the membrane manufacturer, I'll spend uh, a little bit of time on just giving you a better understanding, I hope, of the RO membrane, specifically the high temperature RO membrane, how it works, and what is some of its limitations are. I'll do that through uh, some of the laboratory characterization that we've done with this membrane. And then I'll show you a few applications where this membrane has actually been used in the field in two pilot studies, and then one application, which is a, a full-scale commercial application that's been in use now for a few years. So first of all, introduction to high temperature membranes. And the graphic that uh, show on the screen here is, is very familiar to anyone who works with RO membranes. It's simply the relationship between temperature and one of the most important parameters uh, for any RO system, and that's feed pressure. Clearly, the relationship between feed pressure and temperature is one that, as temperature increases, pressure decreases. And that decrease is more pronounced at lower temperatures and less pronounced at higher temperatures. Uh, there's a relationship, obviously, between pressure and flow. So as pressure decreases at a constant flow, you can also think about that in terms of um, at a constant pressure, flow would increase. But I, I write down here to a point, and that's what's interesting about high, high temperature RO membranes and working with these high temperature RO membranes, is that this relationship um, breaks down a little bit at, at higher temperatures. And I'm going to be showing that later in the presentation. Um, but also on this graphic, you can see here I've placed the normal temperature range that, that the majority of RO systems deal with. It's anywhere between 15 degrees C to about 35 degrees C. And then I've also placed here the normal limitation for a, a typical RO membrane. Most membrane manufacturers set their high temperature limit at about 45 degrees C. And what we hope to do with these uh, high temperature RO membranes is to go beyond that limit of 45 degrees C, going uh, 60 degrees C all the way up to, not even shown on this graphic, is uh, we're going as high as 90 to 95 degrees C. But that max temperature limitation um, is, is, corresponds with a, a pressure. So you always have to think in terms of temperature slash pressure. So temperature limitations for RO membranes and, and pressure limitations for RO membranes go together. So typically, the, the highest pressure you can go to on a standard RO membrane is about 1,200 PSI. And that's at, at lower temperatures. But if you go to higher temperatures, that maximum limit decreases further. So at about 45 degrees C, the maximum limit for a normal RO membrane is 900 PSI. And in these high temperature membranes, that max pressure limitation continues to decrease. So we're at about 60 uh, degrees Celsius. The pressure limit would be 600 PSI. And then I said we're going up all the way to 90 degrees Celsius. But then that pressure limitation drops dramatically down to no more than 100 PSI. Now, what are the cause of those uh, limitations? And, one of the restrictions as we develop these high temperature RO membranes. Well, to, to understand that, just a reminder of what the spiral wound, typical spiral wound RO elements consist of. It consists of three important layers the, the brine spacer, 
and then the other layer is the membrane sheet itself, and then on the permeate side of the membrane is what we have the permeate carrier. So after the water permeates through the membrane, it's um, directed by the permeate carrier along the, the sheet down the spiral into the permeate core tube. But everything you're looking at here is, is a form of a plastic. As we know, at high temperatures, plastics become more ma malleable. So that's essentially where uh, some of the restrictions in, in developing and operating these high temperature RO membranes come from. Uh, one restriction has to do with uh, the permeating carrier. Now here's a side view of that permeate carrier. You can see the permeate carrier consists of uh, little channels where after the water permeates through the membrane, it travels through those channels, like I said, down to the permeate core tube. And what can happen is if, if you're running at very high pressures and high temperatures, the membrane itself can start to emboss down into these channels and restrict the flow of the permeate through these channels and therefore restrict the flow of the water out of the element. Another um, disadvantage of this is as the membrane starts to emboss, it, it creates points of stress on the uh, where the membrane comes in contact with the permeate carrier, and those points of stress can eventually fail, and you can have uh, an increase in salt passage. And what you see here is an actual membrane on the right and the permeate carrier on the left. And normally, the membrane would look like a flat sheet of paper, but since this is been exposed to some high pressures and high temperatures, this normal membrane has been embossed. You can see the lines where it's been permanently deformed down into the membrane here. Another limitation of the RO membrane also deals with the, the permeate carrier. It's the permeate carrier itself. So like I said, there's channels in the permeate carrier. And if those channels are exposed to high pressures and high temperatures, those the channels themselves can begin to collapse. So once again, you have a restriction of the flow through the channels and therefore a restriction of the flow out of the element, which would require more pressure to, to produce the same flows. And then another important plastic component that can fail at the high pressures and high temperatures is the permeating core tube itself. You can see the limitations and you can have a ca catastrophic failure of those core tubes, um, therefore a dramatic increase in the passage of salts. So all of those are the, the type of restrictions that we had to deal with to develop this new high temperature uh, RO membrane. And in order to um, develop it in the laboratory, we used two separate uh, uh, test skids. One skid located in uh, USA was able to run up to 95 degrees Celsius and 1,000 PSI on four inch elements, and then the other test skid located in Japan was able to run up to 600 PSI and 65 degrees Celsius, but had, had the advantage of being able to use 8-inch diameter elements, a little bit larger elements, so we could do different types of characterizations on the two types of test skids. The next graphic that I'll show you illustrates one of the characteriz characterizations that we did, and it illustrates one of the failures as well that I was talking about uh, just a minute ago. So again, we have a temperature on the x-axis versus speed pressure on the uh, y-axis, maintaining a constant flow or a constant flux of 12 GFE. This is a very short test, uh, not exceeding more than, than one day. And it's actually two tests. The, the red line shows the first test, and the blue line shows the second test. So the first test, we start at a uh, pressure and um, temperature about 25 degrees C, and we uh, increase the temperature of the water, maintaining the flux at 12 GFD. That uh, gives us a lower pressure to keep that same flux. But we get up to 65 degrees C, stop, and start lowering the pressure back down to 25 degrees C again. And as you can see, um, what happens is what you would expect to happen, is that you don't see a failure of, of uh, the permeate spacer. So when you return to the 25 degrees C, you still have, um, you still operate at the same pressure that you started with to produce that flux of 12 GFD. When we run that same test again, we really see the, the limitations of this membrane. As you go beyond that 65 degrees C and this high temperature of 600 PSI, and all the way up to 85 degrees C, 
Well, what happens is the permeate carrier starts to collapse. And when we return down to 25 degrees C or close to 25 degrees C, you can see that the element produces less flow or at that 12 GFD requires more pressure now to produce that same flow of 12 GFD. So this, like I said, this was a short term test, just lasting one day on a single element. Another test that we did last a little bit longer. Um, and this test, in, in addition to showing um, the flow, it also shows the other important characteristic of any RO membrane, which is the rejection. So over this 38-day uh, test, what you can see happening is it's actually um, very interesting. The flow begins to drop. Now remember, if you think about the earlier slide where I said that, that pressure decreases, our flow increases at higher temperatures. Well, here we are at 65 degrees C at 600 PSI, and the flow is actually decreasing. And, and so that's what I was saying up to a point, because um, now you have the uh, kind of contradictory effect of kind of annealing of the mem membrane chemistry. And even with these high temperature membranes, there is still some, some collapse of that, that permeate carrier, which results in higher feed pressures, or in this case, since we kept the feed pressure constant, results in a reduction in flow. But the important thing to take away from this test and um, important characteristic that we want to show is that you do have a stabilization. You have kind of an equilibrium point that you reach where that loss of flow stabilizes and ceases, and, and it, it um, continues to operate at, at a, a stable flow, a stable flux. And that loss of flux is somewhere around 40%. So when we're designing a high temperature RO system, um, we make sure that we take into account this loss of flow um, um, when sizing the pumps. There's also an inverse effect when it comes to the rejection. You actually see an increase in the rejection. And again, that's an annealing of the membrane chemistry, kind of a tightening up of the mem membrane chemistry. And it too uh, stabilizes. So there were some points where we saw some drops in membrane rejection, which was a, a bit of a concern. But as I, as I go through some of these other pilots, the full-scale system, you'll, you'll see that uh, rejection is maintained very well. So let's go on to those applications now. Now, like I said, um, let's have two pilot studies where we have um, a limited amount of operating data on them. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit more about the full-scale commercial application, which is the laundry wastewater recycling. So first pilot study that we did was on a high temperature mining waste. This was um, done in Nevada, and the pilot consisted of a UF pretreatment followed by a low pressure RO, which consisted of uh, actually nanofilters, and in the, the last stages of RO membrane. Um, the UF was a ceramic, which is a popular type of UF or MF to use in these high temperature applications because the ceramic material does so well. Um, this pilot, I would say, did not push the limitations of these membranes very far because we were only at 50 degrees C and only at 150 PSI. So it was a good application for um, this type of membrane at these uh, higher temperatures. And we ran this, this pilot for 42 days, we, um, brought the elements back from the pilot and tested them. And again, we, we tested the two important parameters, which are, of course, rejection and flow, and saw less than 5% change in element rejection flux, so stable performance. The pilot itself also uh, was a success in terms of the fact that it did remove 99.5% of the dissolved organic material that it was seeking to remove from the wastewater before it was then reused in the uh, mining application. This pilot was done uh, many years ago, but never went to full scale due to uh, economics. So another application is in uh, oil and gas industry, specifically SAG B, steam assisted gravity drainage. This was a single element pilot test 
that was uh, done in the laboratory, but it was done on actual produced water that came in from a, an oil oil field in Canada that was then heated in, in the laboratory. It operated for a total of 30 days. It operated um, at a little bit more of an extreme condition in terms of uh, temperature around this one at 80 degrees for the 30 day period. And because of the high temperature, uh, the actual pressure was limited, so it's all 100 uh, PSI. And once again, after the 30 day period, uh, we brought the elements back, we retested them, you can see the original element rejection 99.7. We brought it back for a retest. It actually improved again from that feeling to 99.8. Um, the flow started at uh, 825 GPD off of this four inch element, it's a small element. Um, so when we returned it, we tested it in the factory as expected, just to the high temperatures and probably to cowling uh, as well. Uh, we saw a 14% loss in the flow, but still uh, good. Performance, stable performance over the uh, duration of the pilot test. This application also did not go to full scale. It was done just in, when the oil prices were very high back in 2006, 2007. There was a, a drop in oil prices, so uh, it never went to full scale due to the low oil prices. Okay, and so finally, the um, High temperature application, which has gone to full scale, has been in commercial use for many years now, it has to do with laundry wastewater recycling. This has the advantage of um, saving not only on water, it recovers uh, 75 to 80 percent of the water and reuses it in the laundry application. It also has the advantage of um, reducing energy consumption by not having to reheat that water in the laundry. So that also reduces energy consumption by as much as uh, 50 percent. The laundry uh, waste application uh, systems consist of uh, shaker screen filters for um, removing fibrous material when it is present. If the particular laundry waste application doesn't require, uh, doesn't have the fibrous material, they won't have the, the shaker screens. Um, then it's followed by a screen a filter, about 150 microns, before it goes to the MF for the particulate removal. And again, the MF is a ceramic MF. Now, normally in laundry waste applications for recovering this water, they would require heat exchangers to bring the water down to below 45 degrees Celsius. But because in, in, in the new applications, they're starting to use the high temperature membranes, that heat exchanger, of course, is no longer needed. And then before it goes to the RO, it's, uh, it does its chemical injections, which includes the particular pH adjustment, and then into an RO system. Here's a typical RO system, fairly small system. These, uh, these laundry waste applications, they're, they're typically industrial laundry systems, um, so they'll be treating uh, laundries that come from a number of hospitals in the region, or they may be um, treating uh, laundry that comes from a number of uh, hotels or resorts in the regions. So some actual operating data in these systems. I've got two sets of operating data. The first one is uh, fairly simple, just uh, three different parameters that were tracked, and it's over a period of just a couple months from February to April. But the three parameters that were tracked, first of all, down here is the differential pressure. So differential pressure, pressure between the feed end and the RO system and the concentrated end the RO system remain fairly stable, and thank, that's thanks to the, uh, the uh, MF, the ceramic M NF, MF, removing any uh, particulates. Then you also have up here the normalized permeating flow, and what you can see from this data is that actually in this two-month period, they had uh, four cleanings, so they're cleaning every couple of weeks which is, is frequent compared to some RO systems, but because of the high fouling nature of the, the water that they're recovering, um, this is uh, fairly normal for these laundry waste recycling systems. You'll see some stable normalized permeate flow for a couple of weeks, and, and then they'll do a cleaning, and they'll recover that normalized permeate flow. Um, see it drop off here, and 
cleaning the cupboards, more of a drop off, uh, cleaning the cupboards. So they get into kind of a stable, normal low operation where uh, they're cleaning a couple of weeks. So flow is stable, and then the other parameter, of course, that's important is the rejection. You can see uh, rejection along the top here of the container. Very good rejection above 99% during this uh, two month set of data. But like I said, these systems have been in operation for a couple of years, so we, we have a lot more data than just a couple of months. This particular set of data is uh, over a period of one year of continuous operation. So this, uh, this particular site is treating water that was at 50 degrees Celsius. And the, the data that I'll point out here to you is, is the TMP, the transmembrane pressure, and essentially the feed pressure is in red here. And you can see initially in the first month or so, the, there's this increase in feed pressure. Again, not a surprise based on the, um, the laboratory data that I showed earlier. There, there's some compaction, there's some annealing of the membrane, but after that 40% that increase in feed pressure, feed pressure essentially stabilizes out for the remainder of the operating. Uh, the other parameter here that's important is the permeate conductivity, which is some light brown here. So you can see it's stable over the one-year period. There, there is some increase down here later in the year, but that, that just corresponds to an increase in the, the feeds. So overall rejection is stable over this one year. So the other two uh, applications that I mentioned that, that we piloted, I, I said, didn't go forward to full scale because of the economics. Uh, fortunately, the laundry waste application does give good economics. So I just want to uh, quickly touch on, on that, what kind of economics they see and what kind of return on investment they get from these uh, systems. And you can, just some basic numbers for a, a mid-size uh, laundry system is the value of the, the Recycled laundry wastewater adds up to about 170,000. 170, if you add the value of the heat that you save by not having to um, reduce the, the heat, the temperature of the water, and then reheat the water, you add on about 81,000. Then you subtract from that um, the annual operating costs for just running the, the membrane systems. It's about 33,900. So it comes out to a, a net savings. 217,000 per year, which leads to a return on investment for this facility of uh, two, almost a little less than 200,000. And there's lots of assumptions that I used that I'm sure can be tested, but I'm not going to go into any more of those assumptions. So, in conclusion, uh, we do have a high temperature RO, it is limited by correlation of temperature and pressure relative to a typical RO system which has a 45 degrees C at 900 PSI temperature uh, pressure uh, limitation. The new elements can go as high as 90 degrees C, but that is still with a pressure limitation down at 100 PSI. We demonstrated on several applications. I showed the mining rate wastewater application which ran for 42 days at 50 degrees Celsius and 150 PSI, and then uh, produced water application uh, 30 days at 80 degrees Celsius and 100 PSI, and we fully expect produced water and uh, or the oil and gas applications to return uh, someday. But the, the uh, commercial application right now where it's really taken off is on the wastewater application, where we have years of uh, performance um, at temperatures of around 50 degrees C and uh, low 100 degrees C. Um, other applications where this membrane could be used range from things like um, treating hot, hot condensate, boiler water blow down, uh, cleaning hot cleaners, uh, treating the balance from annealing baths, um, treating waters in, in hot climates. So Middle East, for example, where they're, they're transferring water over long distances and pipelines. That water can get to exceed 45 degrees Celsius. Another application uh, is specific to the sugar industry, where they're removing the color from the, the sugar stream, the syrup stream, which is uh, often at high temperatures. That is all I have.
at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll now open the webinar up to anyone that has any questions. Please type your question in the chat field or the Q&A field, and I will ask the author um, your question. We have um, two different questions from the same person. They are, what kind of MF was used for the laundry application, and is that from Hydronautics too? Okay, the MF was a ceramic MF, like I mentioned, I don't know the specific um, brand, and, and therefore, no, it was not a hydronautics uh, and a hydronautics only mix polymer. It's not ceramic. Okay. And the other question is, are there different limitations in terms of temperature and pressure for the 4 versus the 8 RO high temperature membranes? Oh, yeah, good question. And the answer is, you know, regardless of 4 inch, or eight inch uh, pressure temperature limitations are going to be the same. Okay, if anyone else has any other questions, um, feel free to email me or I can send you um, to the author and they can answer your questions if they come up later um, after the webinar has concluded. Um, thank you again for your presentation. Um, that will now conclude the IWC Best of Webinar Series, Recycle. I want to give a special um, thanks again to our presenters. Just a reminder, there is more Best of IWC webinars coming up. Um, we have one set in May. The July date is still being determined, and we have an August date. Um, you can find more information about the webinars on our website um, under IWC Best of Webinar Series. You can also purchase the papers of, that were presented today um, for only $10 on our website, and uh, the paper numbers are 1606 and 1649. Thank you again for attending. If you logged in to today's webinar, you are officially logged in, and I will send you your certificate within a week of the webinar. If you are listening to the webinar or viewing the webinar in a group setting, please go online and fill out the group login sheet and email it to t.bombalski at eswp.com if you'd like a PDH hour um, for this webinar. Thank you again for attending, and I hope to see you at the conference in November.